to another episode of Ask a Pianist. My name is Andrew Ahrens, and today we'll be continuing our discussion about creating a singing tone. In a previous video, I had outlined three facets of creating a singing tone. Understand your instrument, understand your body, and understand the musical context. In this episode, we'll focus on the third, understand the musical context. What do I mean by this? Essentially, the audience perception of a singing tone is heavily influenced by the texture of the music and the overall musical aesthetic. Singing tones do not exist in a vacuum. They tend to be most effective when they are supported by a bedding of continuous sound, and control of the musical texture is vital for making a singing tone take flight. In addition to this vertical element, we also have to take into account the horizontal and structural context. Is the singing tone being used frequently, or is it something that stands out in the piece at one special moment? Finally, as pianists, we have to adjust the singing tone according to what composer or aesthetic style we are playing in order to have the best chance of communicating our sonic intentions. So, let's start by looking at the most common textural situation for producing a singing tone. The texture of melody over accompaniment is one that dominates keyboard music, and for good reason. If a collection of sounds contains many different timbres, the ear can be drawn to any of the individual voices that stands out. However, if the collection contains similar timbres, the ear tends to be drawn to the highest pitch. Since keyboard instruments produce one general kind of sound, composers from Bach to Ligeti recognize the necessity of using a distribution of melody over harmony. A typical example can be found in Chopin. This kind of texture is perhaps the easiest one to control in terms of creating a singing tone in the melody. The accompaniment and melody are spaced widely apart, so there is clear acoustic separation. Furthermore, the accompaniment forms a continuous cushion of sound. Once this cushion is set, we can forget about it and focus on what kind of singing tone we want to create. One can easily adjust the singing tone to be more penetrating, like this, one can adjust it to be more velvety and gentle, like this. The distribution between melody and accompaniment here allows these adjustments to be made very easily and so, in a sense, this is the simplest format in which to explore and create beautiful singing tones. Sometimes we find as pianists that we're tasked with playing suspended or long-held notes over a fast-moving accompaniment. This can create a problem when we're trying to make the melody sing, 
because the accompaniment may appear to interfere or accidentally separate elements of the melody, making it sound disjointed rather than smooth. When we come across this kind of difficulty, we must first and foremost have a look at the accompaniment to figure out in what ways it can help the melody sustain itself. In this prelude, again by Chopin, he gives us a melody accompaniment distribution which is very much like the Bersus, only this time the melody has far fewer notes than the accompaniment does. The melody itself is rather static, in fact, and played on its own, it naturally can veer towards sounding disjointed, or at the very least, somewhat segmented. The accompaniment is complex, and because it moves rapidly, it naturally may draw the listener's ear away from the melody. When played without differentiation, it's almost as if the left hand has the melody, and the right hand is merely commenting on it. make the left hand work for the right hand, in two different ways. First, of course, the left hand must be played much softer than the right, but also in a more transparent way. Ideally, the two contrary motion voices in the left hand would be easy to hear and differentiate by ear. Next, the right hand still poses a problem. Because there are so few notes, we have to find a way to prevent the melody from sounding disjointed. But this is a little more complex than it may seem at first. In order for a melody to sing in a smooth way, there's a small principle which must be understood. When a note is played, it sounds loud at first and decays slowly, like this. We cannot sustain a note the way a violinist or a singer can. Because of this, we are left in the unenviable position of having to create the illusion of continuity in sound when we play notes legato. After we play our first note of our melody, every note after must come close enough in time to the first to replenish the overall sound or volume. It's easy if the melody is fast moving, and if I play the melody here very fast, then we can create a nice legato melody with ease. But if the notes are not close together in time, then the note will decay enough that the next note played will sound like it's a subtle interruption in sound. This problem can only be solved by utilizing the material in the accompaniment to help smooth over the decay of the melody. What we're about to do is a subtle but common practice. We'll take the melody one note at a time. The first note of the theme falls to the second, like this. 
Because of this fall, and because I choose to play it with a slight decrescendo, the accompaniment doesn't have to play much of an active role. It just has to match the dynamic change. But the next note in the melody is one that I want to play louder, as if the second note grows towards the third. This growth in dynamic level is impossible on the piano, and if I played it this way, then you'd get a note that sticks out like a sore thumb. The only way to make this work is to create the illusion of melody growth by making the accompaniment grow in dynamic instead. The melody note is played, but the accompaniment has a slight crescendo, and the next melody note can then be played loudly without seeming out of place. I'll play it first without the third melody note, so you can hear what the accompaniment does to prepare the sound. Now, here's the melody note where it belongs with the preparation. In this way, we give the illusion that the melody is always singing, even though it is in fact always decaying. The bed of sound generated by the accompaniment not only serves as a support for the singing melody, but it also directly affects how the sound of the melody is perceived. All that being considered, a pianist must also decide what kinds of singing tones can be used in a piece, depending upon the overall structure. Even though it's a wonderful skill to be able to create a beautiful singing tone, the effect diminishes entirely if used too often or without any variation. I'd like us to consider the situation now where a composer appears to reserve a special place in a work where application of a singing tone can truly be a special event. We'll stay with Chopin as he wrote music which is quite well suited for the pianist who is learning to cultivate a beautiful singing tone. In his Barcarolle, Chopin gives us mainly chordal melodies for the most part. Even the opening statement of the theme is written in thirds rather than single notes. We should probably aim to use a singing tone here, but the thirds in the melody may cause the cultivation of a singing tone to take second place behind a flawless legato execution. of the right hand, we still don't have much room to sing clearly. however, Chopin allows the musical boat ride to grind to a halt, being replaced by a small section of almost non-metrical music. Furthermore, the texture is entirely changed to resemble something out of one of his nocturnes, single note accompaniments supporting single note melodies. Lastly, and most importantly, the melody is far enough away from the accompaniment in terms of register that we have a clear distinction between the two. Chopin definitely wants us to sing here.
music itself is wonderful, but it is made even more special because it only occurs once in the piece. So far in this episode, we've been working in the realm of Chopin and his sound world. Lots of pedal, a little rubato here and there, and overall a sense of ease when it comes to music making. Obviously, not all composers are like this, and in fact I would argue that a pianist should attempt to cultivate a different kind of singing tone for each composer they play. The singing sound used in Chopin would be different from the one used in Rachmaninoff, for instance. On a more subtle level, the singing tone used in Schubert would be slightly different from the one used in Mozart or Beethoven. It's one thing to learn how to create a generic singing tone. This is something we must all learn. But to figure out and cultivate singing tones for each composer, and hopefully each individual circumstance, is something that takes a lifetime. All that being said, here's how I view some of the major composers and their sound worlds when it comes to a singing tone. With Chopin, I tend to stay in the realm of clear and clean, and very rarely will I make the sound quality in a singing passage seem veiled or muffled. That is a special effect in Chopin from my point of view. However, with Foray, I actually use this muffled style as a base point of reference. The melody, if I play it with a Chopin style sound, would be like this. There's nothing wrong with that, but I prefer to veil the sound slightly, giving the listener the impression that the music will not explain itself so easily or readily, and that the music must be explored by the listener in a more active way than with Chopin. Instead of this... I veil and mute the sound like this. The sonic impression is that the music is hiding something, and it is up to the listener to find out what it is. With Bach, you are entering a world quite different from Chopin. Pedaling is reserved for resonance purposes, or special effects really, and clarity of counterpoint takes precedence over beauty of sound atmosphere. Furthermore, it is actually quite rare that Bach gives you a section where a traditional singing tone can be applied, and if that does occur, then the melody is usually ornamented quite heavily, which makes it more difficult to produce and sustain a singing tone than in other composers. I find that I tend to produce a sound for a Bach singing tone that is more transparent and more percussive than what I would use in Chopin, purely as a practical issue. If I use a thick, molasses type of sound, then the trills can be destroyed too easily.
mention molasses, I think I should talk about the sound I tend to use most often in Brahms. I try to create the thickest, fattest sound I can, but this is used as a foil against the rhythm, which I do tend to keep slightly more strict than the average pianist. have arguably more flexible singing tones. In Beethoven, for instance, I use a different type of singing tone when I'm playing his earlier repertoire than I do when playing his later repertoire. The earlier singing tone is very similar to the one I use in Mozart, reasonably transparent and flute-like. something slightly darker than the sound I use in Chopin. combination of bass singing tones in certain composers where I think the music benefits from it. Ravel, for example, tends to require a very clean sound, like that used in Bach. However, there's a hidden element to the sound trapped under the surface of the music, and this in my view means that the clean sound must have a depth to it. One can think of the difference between the sound of a cello playing a musical line as opposed to a bassoon. The bassoon's sound is more defined or focused than the cello's, which, on the other hand, tends to sound very smooth and elegant. With Ravel, I want the clarity of the double reed instrument, but with the resonance capability of the cello. That's what I aim for.
on and on, as each composer has their own sound, and indeed a sound must be individually crafted for each piece and musical circumstance. The examples I've demonstrated are to give you an idea of what is possible, and what we can aim for when we're lost for sound options. Also, it must be said that these viewpoints are the ones I currently hold, and that they may change over time as I continue my own musical journey through life. It's not about making a rule to say, Bach has to be played this way. It's more about saying, what options do you have to create a beautiful singing tone, and which ones will be more successful at communicating your intentions than others? So, that's it for this episode of Ask a Pianist. Until next time, keep practicing, keep exploring sound possibilities, and don't let yourself be satisfied with an average or on-par sound quality. Try to create a sound that is life-changing. Bye for now.